Grant Gonaut, and this is the 17th episode of the Mawcast, where we're going to be discussing the question, what God are we seeking after? Please right now subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, follow us on Instagram, and this video, is law, as well as all of our others, will be linked in the description to audio platforms. So like I said, we're going to be discuss discussing the question, what God are we seeking after? Because sometimes we don't even know that we're seeking after other gods or things of this world that are not the true God of the Bible. And so, to start, a lot of times as Christians, or as people in general that aren't Christians, we have aspirations generally as human beings to set out and do things that we want to accomplish. That's normal. Right now we have a aspiration behind Mog to tell people the word of God for them to grow as men and women in the gospel and to grow in that message. And we, ha we have motivations behind it too. And those motivations can even be wicked, even on the uh, platform of Christianity. And so that's the thing. As Christians, we have to ask ourselves the question, why do I want this and what motivates me towards it? Um, the verse that really we can look at for this is Jeremiah 17.9 which reads, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So the human heart deceives us. A lot of times we want things that we think are going to benefit us and are good for us as Christians. And they seem good, sometimes, but they're ultimately going to, end to uh, result in destruction. And for instance, a lot of times certain relationships with a man or a woman look appealing to our eyes and we think, oh, this would be good for me to get involved in. I'm a Christian. I think it would be good for me to, you know, maybe get an opportunity to lead this person. And we get, in, it, it, and it is, it's in of it's a good thing. In of, it, it's of itself, it is a good thing, but it end up, ends up leading to hurt and pain. And that goes with a lot of things like, you know, a lot of times we say, oh, maybe let me just try this. Let me just try this. Let me just try this. Then we have these aspirations to go out and do things and our motivations behind it are wrong. And we do see this in the church, in the book of Jude and all over the place in the New Testament and Old Testament. We see old, false teachers being called out because their aspirations look like something that's pure, but the motivation behind them is very impure and filthy. And that's what Jeremiah is talking about is the human heart due to the fall in Genesis three is decept is deceitful above all things. And we can't even know it. We can't begin to grasp how easily our heart is led astray to carnal things of the world. And we need to constantly be checking that as Christians as we said in the last episode, if we're not disciplined, we're not going to be checking in on what our heart's telling us. And our heart isn't usually right most of the time. What the Word of God says is right all of the time. So we should be going to that for our answers and not to our heart and emotions. Because um, they ultimately are a fabricated indicator of what we want. And a lot of times what we want, the aspiration isn't bad, but the motivations behind it are something that's not coming from the Lord. And so, yeah, Beck's going to stem off of that. Yeah, so we're going to answer the big question in this one. So, what is our purpose in life? I think this is very relevant. What is your guy's purpose in life? In Colossians 1.16, it indicates that you were created to give glory to God. And then in Ecclesiastes 3, it says that God has set eternity on our hearts. So there's this eternal, God-sized gap in our hearts that only He can satisfy. And yet we try to fill those up with things like sex, money, power. And we try to make them our gods to fill, fill our heart. And it's just this void, and we keep plugging away, and we throw money at it. We throw relationships at it. We throw power into it. And yet none of those things satisfy. You keep wanting more. God was the only thing created to fill your heart. And so um, as we look at other gods, they're insufficient. I'm looking at Jeremiah 2 right now. And Jeremiah is a great book if you're looking at idols or false gods. Because God is saying um, you know, to his people, why are you worshiping a wooden statue when I'm right here, right? Um, these these things are dead, 
They don't offer you any value. They didn't create you, love you. They didn't form you. Um, they do nothing good for you. And yet you still are worshiping them after you've seen the good I've done to you. You've seen the good I've done to your fathers. You've seen the good I've done to your people as that I led them out of Egypt and out of captivity into freedom. And it says right here in verse 13 of chapter 2, For my people have committed two evils. First, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. So our first sin in this slippery slope of creating false idols in our lives is just neglecting God. It's not so much um, actually going out and worshiping something else yet. It's neglecting God, right? Not finding him as satisfying, not going to him for the satisfaction that we need in our hearts, not going to him um, to worship because as humans, we're always worshiping something and we need to be worshiping the Lord and a lot of times we're not, we're worshiping ourselves most of the time. And we do that by these false idols. That's like a means to do it, right? We worship those idols, but we're also really worshiping ourselves. Because we think that we're the most important and we got to do whatever we uh, want to do so that we can feel good. That's like how most of the people live their lives. Mm-hmm. How can I feel best? What relationship can I get? How much money can I have to where I'm comfortable and I feel good? Mm-hmm. That's pretty much how our lives is. And then so many people right now are depressed so many people aren't satisfied. It's because they're looking for love in all the wrong places. So God's saying, one, to his people, man, don't neglect me. Yeah. That, then number two, and then they've made themselves cisterns. They've made themselves well, wells, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So they made themselves, they got the fountain of living waters, God, and then they go and make for themselves a well that can't even hold water. Right? And God's saying, basically, you guys are worshiping things that don't give you any value. Like, think about it. From our God, we need someone supernaturally that can give us forgiveness, that can heal us from our sin, that can give us grace and mercy and strength when we need it. Money, sex, power can't do that for you. So, your God is insufficient. Mm -hmm. You need something greater and bigger than that. So, what are you looking to? These people were looking at wood statues. That's not going to give you the forgiveness from sin that you need. We look at money. That's not going to buy your way out of hell, right? We need God. Yeah. That's the one whom our heart was fashioned for. That's the only one that can satisfy us. And yet people don't like that. Don't like that answer because that means they know they're going to have to turn from their sin. Yeah. That's pretty much what it gets down to. We, we like our sin, we like our false idols, and that's why we keep them up. You know, there's a lot of, I won't go on too long, but there was a lot of kings of Israel um, that were bad kings because maybe, you know, they offered sacrifices, they were doing good things that God said in the temple, right? Maybe the exact same way, but yet on the hills of Israel, they would let um, altars to false gods remain. Yeah. Right? Don't let anything remain, any worship to false gods. Strip them down. Those were the good kings in Israel, the ones that tore down those high places where we, they were worshiping to other gods and only instituted um, work, worship and sacrifice at the temple. And that's what we need to be doing. We only worship the true and living God. We don't mess around with the other things. Right? We don't play a double-minded game where we're trying to serve two masters. Jesus said that's impossible. Right? If you're not serving me uh, fully, you're not serving me. Yeah. So, um, take a good, honest look at your life because this is for your benefit. Do you want to drink from the fountain of living waters that can satisfy your soul or an empty well? That's what it comes down to because you're always going to be thirsty at one or God's going to satisfy your thirst at the other. And so, it's a hard decision only because um, we like our sin. So, if you say, if you want to like make this decision to make God your God that sits on the throne of your heart, the only one you strive after you got to come to the, um, you know, come to the place where you recognize, okay, I'm going to have to kill my sin and I'm going to be okay with it. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. If you're not willing to do that, you're probably not willing to put God first in your life. So, um, I hope you guys see the need for us to put God as number one and then not to, you know, mess around with anything else because God is all that we need. Yeah. And so, like Beck said, there's a, so much truth in that and a lot of truth that as humans we don't want to hear because it's it's 
t- it's telling us to flee from sin, mm-hmm. run to God, whatever you have, drop it, mm-hmm. give it all to him. And sometimes we don't, a lot of times we don't want to hear that. And in the Old Testament, we see another prominent character, probably have heard of him, King Solomon, mm-hmm. who's the author of Proverbs. And that book of Proverbs highlights three main themes. Beck brought them up earlier, sex, wealth, and power. Mm-hmm. And in today's society, with social media, with billboards that advocate sex to us, with commercials that tell us, entre- entrepreneurs telling us wealth is going to make you happy. You deserve this car. You deserve this mm-hmm. house. With power, just you see power everywhere. Mm-hmm. The more power we have, the more successful we'll be because more doors will be open and we'll be more satisfied mm-hmm. and we'll be able to sleep at night because we'll have climbed the ranks and we'll be content. Mm-hmm. But no. All we, we, we're so deceived, like in Jeremiah 17, 9, that all we're doing is digging a deeper hole that we can't even see that we're digging. Mm-hmm. And it's just a bigger void that the Lord's able to fill. But a lot of times it's until we dig the hole so deep with se- sex, money, and power that we get to the bottom of the hole and we have nowhere else to look but up to God. Yeah. And that's what Solomon had to do in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, which according to most scholars was, was written towards the end of his life. And it's after he experienced sex, wealth, and power all to an extent that we will never be able to as humans. We can read all about that in the Old Testament. And this was 2,000 years ago. And these things are still highly relevant in today's society. Matter of fact, most detectives and crime cases, they say all three of those, all of the crimes usually resolve around sex, wealth, and power. That's what people crave mm-hmm. at the root of most things. And it's because they think it's filling something up that it's not. Mm-hmm. And all the answers and resources are in here, but we're living in a society that's growing farther and farther away from this and more and more into the darkness and closet and lies of Satan. And we need the word because we know that our hearts are deceptively wicked. We keep going back to this verse, but it's so, there's so much truth in it when we really understand, wow, when I wake up in the morning, I need to think of where my thoughts are actually going because most of the times they're leading to a place that isn't holy and righteous. And so, yeah, the end of, we're talking about idols. Whenever we say gods, we're not talking about, oh, you're down worshiping your money, you're down worshiping your clothes, worshiping your wife. We're just saying that takes place over God. Mm-hmm. This is more important to me than checking in on God and him being my number one priority. That's what an idol is. Is it taking more attention, taking attention away from God, and is it replacing his role in our lives? It is essentially, there's so many different definitions you could draw for an idol, but it's something that replaces totally replaces God's role in our lives. And a lot of times as Christians, we can subconsciously mask having idols because we can show up to church on Sundays, but as we're worshiping, there's other idols that we're maybe even thinking about during worship subconsciously that we can't wait to get to. Mm-hmm. And that's that's crazy. And at the end of the book of 1 John, chapter 5, 21, the last verse in the book, John says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this is, according to most scholars, again, even though Revelation is the last book in the Bible, 1 John is probably the last book written, the latest book written in the Bible. And what's the last verse? If, If that's true, think about what the first verse and the last verse in the Bible would say. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. That's insane. So we know God created the heavens and the earth. And what what should we do? Keep ourselves from idols. Keep our eyes on who? Fixated on the cross. Because that's the only thing that Beck was talking about that's going to keep us a full cistern. Ready to do the Lord's work. Mm -hmm. And even on a day-to-day basis, we can become deceived. And maybe we have an idol for a day. Mm -hmm. It's not a... But... And the Lord is so quick to forgive us because we know it says in the New Testament that he was faithful even when we had no faith, which is so comforting and just stirs us up with joys as true believers of God. And so how do we do this, though? How do we do what? How do we keep ourselves from idols like John says here? And I think we have the answer right here in Scripture. All right, you're going to have to cut cut to me getting to this. I think we have the answer here in scripture in the 139th Psalm with David at the very end in verses 23 and 24 David says this 
Search me, O God, and know my heart. Yeah. Try me and know my anxi- yeah. anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. Mm-hmm. And lead me in the way everlasting. What do we have to do? We have to take an action. Stirred by the Holy Spirit to ask God to search us. To know our heart. To try me and know my anxieties. And to see if there's any wicked way on us. And to lead us to the way everlasting. And what we have to ask ourselves then is, do we actually want to be searched? Because if we don't want to be searched, then we want to hold on to the sin in our lives. Mm -hmm. And so, to close out, we have to allow God to seek us. And we have to seek God, but God also wants to seek our own hearts Mm -hmm. and seek the impurities in our hearts in order to purify us. So, thank you for tuning into the 17th episode of the Modcast where Beck and I addressed the question of, what God are we serving in our lives? So please, once again, subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Follow us on Instagram. And this video, as well as all, as well as all the others, will be linked in the description on audio platforms. Thank you. Have a blessed week. Peace. Peace.